Palumbo, we are live. Welcome, welcome to Head to Head. This is only the third Head to Head that I have done, so I'm excited that you're here. My pleasure. Let me start our, our little intro slide. I'm also excited to find you in the States. Well, I've been here for the last year, believe it or not. <laughs> As many of us have. So I see we have some people starting to come on now. It's, uh, we're still, what, a little bit before. So, yep, just right at 12 o'clock. So people are probably still getting their lunch together and, and uh, getting things rocking and rolling. Are we allowed to eat during this? <laughs> they are. They are. We're, well, the participants are. So it you seems like the speaker would be more relaxed if, if he or she could eat while everybody else is eating, then it would really feel like we were doing sort of a lunch and learn. But if, if the speaker can't eat and everybody else is eating, it puts the speaker at a disadvantage, in my opinion. So I would say what you should do is say, grab your sandwich. We're going to have lunch here. And then everybody just chows down at the same time and talks. So that whole talking with your mouth full, I don't know about that. So you know, even, even virtually, there's probably some limits. So... <laughs> So I see Miss Alma is on here. Yeah, you can pretend. So I, I definitely keep the uh, the water close by, though, uh, especially in Florida this time of year. So it's always uh, nice to have all the pollen. And uh, I know my car that's sitting outside is going to have to have a bath here very, very soon. So oh, we already have chat going. So oh, Alma says hello. She says hello to everybody. So it's good to have you on. So, all righty. Well, we're going to get started as people uh, come in and, you know, with it being the lunch hour or if you're on the West Coast, it's, uh, it's coffee and, and uh, breakfast hour. So whatever you're doing, just whatever floats your boat, we're good with it here. So Head to Head, of course, is not a webinar uh, and it's not a podcast. So it's just kind of a, a conversation uh, where we talk and uh, allow you to join in and ask questions, and we certainly encourage a, uh, a very lively chat. So uh, join us uh, as you can and, and pop in with, uh, with whatever questions you have. Um, John, let's kick it off. I got a question for you. So uh, you've been at this a minute or two. I, I think I've, I've known you for, I don't know how many years. I don't know that either one of us want to admit that, but uh, so you, you've been doing this a little while. What's the best advice that you would give to people that are just getting into new home sales or in the home building industry? The best advice that I would give to someone getting in the new homes industry, um, just stick with it. You can make a lot of money in this. I mean, that's as simple as it gets. I, I made, I've made a lot of money in the new home sales industry from all angles uh, and every aspect of new homes. So I think it's a great business. I think it's a great opportunity. And um, if people stick to it and learn all the facets of the business, they will do well as a career with it. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. So I think that's one of the hardest things for people who are starting out in new homes to really see the vision of, of what it can be. Because I think the first six months, particularly when you're commission only, uh, can be really tough and it can be quite a barrier to entry. Um, so I, uh, I, I always advise people to, to make sure they can make it over that first little hump, because I think it's one of the most rewarding industries that you could be in. So as we're, let me go ahead and get all of our slides out of the way too. So I want to go ahead and get our contact information. We're just doing things different today. We're just mixing everything up. Uh, if you guys want to reach out to us, this is the best way to reach us. Um, so, and, and of course you can reach out to me and I'll make sure that, uh, that, uh, John ha I can forward it on to John or send you his contact information as well. So these are our websites and then I'm going to close out, uh, that so that we can actually just look at each other and talk. Uh, that always goes a lot better, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. All right. So tell me more about what you think for somebody who is, who is getting into this industry, how can they stay motivated through that initial, oh my gosh, this, 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 this industry is a little crazy curve because I think we have to be a little bit nuts to be in new home sales in a good way. 
Well, for me, it was never that way. Uh, before I got into the housing industry, I sold a lot of different things. I sold insurance, I sold cars. Uh, I actually took a job one day uh, with a company and before the day was over, I quit because I said it, it wasn't for me. And when I got into new home sales, I felt it that first day I had found my home. And I never had those, those uh, humps or puddles to have to jump through because it just felt natural to me. And I knew that I had found my calling in this industry. And so I think for some people they may struggle, but I think for the right people, they're gonna feel like they have found a home when they get in here. And it's just a matter of, you know, this is the industry I want to be in. And if you feel it, and if it's a calling for you, then I think that you're going to do well. I don't think that there's really going to be a problem for those first six months. Um, I've done work with a lot of people and they've gone to work for companies where people sort of condole them for the first couple of months saying, don't worry, you know, not making sales the first few weeks or the first few months is understandable. You're just starting to learn the business, but I, I didn't get in the business that way. I don't usher people into the business that way. Uh, if I hire somebody, I expect them to sell something the first week, maybe even the first day, because they have the same opportunity to sell something to somebody as a pro does. It's been in the business 20 years. If a prospect walks in uh, five minutes after they're hired, they could and should be able to sell to them. So I don't think there's any grace period for when you come in. I think you get in, you either feel it, and if you don't, get out. It's as simple as that. If you don't feel it and if it's not for you, get out. I did it in other industries. I got out of them very quickly when I realized they weren't for me. And when I knew that I found a home here, um, it, I went gun ho with it. And it's been a good business to me ever since. So, you know, staying motivated is uh, really an internal thing. Nobody motivates you. I don't, you don't, uh, other speakers don't motivate people. They motivate themselves. And they do that by their own paths that they're taking. Some people get motivated by the money they make. Some people get motivated by reading books about how others have done it so that they can shorten their curve. Others like to do it with audios. And there's so many array of audios you can listen to out there that are success stories, stories about technique, strategies, um, you know, depending on what it is that you like. But I've always been a person that liked to listen to the audios and read the books and shorten the curves for me so that I could uh, not have to make as many mistakes. But each individual has their own, you know, path that they want to go down for what motivates them. But I tell people when I'm speaking, whether it's to a, a small intimate group or a, a large, you know, auditorium of a, a few thousand people that I don't really feel like I can motivate you. You have to motivate yourself. I'm just a messenger that gives you some ideas that can help you motivate yourself. So when it comes to motivation, I think the individual does that for themselves. And, you know, the, the teachers and speakers and writers and people like that out there are the ones that simply hold their hand along the way of their own paths. Yeah, I always say you have to put the good stuff in in order to get the good stuff out. So uh, and to, to your point, I sold a home the very first day I was on the floor. My manager sent me out there and said, go sell something, Mackie, and handed me keys and showed me where the first inventory home was. And so when I called him back a few hours later and I said, I I've got a sale, he goes, oh, sure you do. And I'm like, well, I've got a check for $10,000 right here. I didn't know how much to ask for. So I asked for that. Is that okay? I didn't even know how to turn the computer on. So he had to come out and he had to turn the computer on for me. So yeah, it, uh, it, it definitely happens. And, and I'm with you. I, I knew I found my home. I knew this was where I was supposed to be. And anytime I've done anything to try to go down a different path, um, you know, it, I, I come right back. It, it, it just pulls me right back in. Right. So you talked about sure. books and you talked about the ability to shorten the curve and uh, I think if I'm counting correctly, you've sold, you've, you've written and sold about uh, or 10 books now. And I know you sell a ton of those. So through NAHB books and where else do you, on your website and through various different channels that, that you offer these books? A lot of different channels. Yes. Uh, of course, our website um, at johnpalumbo.com. A lot of people order uh, products uh, to help them through their sales there and Amazon and of course the NHB bookstore at the Builder Show, the International Builder Show, where we uh, typically are highlighted in their bookstores, all our products are. So just a variety of channels. And when I'm speaking, uh, a lot of people will, uh, you know, take products away with them at speaking events that I'm at. So all, all of those are venues. 
Yeah. And it's just always amazed me how many, I, how many books you've written. So, you know, as busy as you are with all the travel that you do and, and with all the speaking engagements, I mean, how do you find time to get the words down on paper and get them out? Uh, the words go down on paper over a period of years, literally. Uh, since I got into the business, I began taking notes of stuff that jumped out of my mouth. And I think every person who's ever had a conversation or a sales presentation has said things, uh, especially in sales, uh, that at the end of the presentation or when the people leave, they go, damn, that was really good what I said. <laughs> and the real key there is you can't just say, damn, that was really good. You got to write it down so that you can memorialize it so that you can use it again in your presentations. And in my case, I used it in presentations to enhance sales when I said things that really came out good and then eventually turned those into articles and those articles eventually got turned into manuscripts The manuscripts eventually get turned into books and then they eventually get turned into seminars. And so there's a complete circle that goes with that first word that jumps out of your mouth. And it, it's really called memorialize it because what gets recorded eventually gets rewarded. And, and that's how the spoken word eventually makes its way down that journey for me. Ooh, I like that. What gets recorded, say that again, what gets recorded eventually gets rewarded. Pretty much. Did I get it right? So Yeah, you got it right. You yeah. actually did. Yeah, I like that a lot. So, and so often when I'm in a presentation, I'm like, oh, that was good. I need to make sure I, I remember that. So I'm sure as sales managers and, and salespeople, you know, we've all had those moments. Uh, and I think the key there is to learn, to, to write it down so you remember it, you can incorporate it further, but also to learn from it and build on it. Yeah. Um, I go to a lot of seminars uh, with a lot of different people. When I take a notebook, one side of the page is of the notebook is for the notes for the speaker that I like the ideas, but the other side of the page are the ideas that it's generating inside of my own head that are not anything to do with what the speaker does, but their ideas cause my brain to start generating a lot of strategies and ideas. So I keep two separate notes uh, when I'm listening to someone else, their notes and my notes. My notes are strictly what's being generated by the power plant, so to speak, uh, as they speak and in their notes, which are good ideas that I want to learn from. Oh, that's, that's really smart to keep them in two separate places. So I think a lot of us go and we take notes, but uh, you know, we may take them all down together. I like to take action items and do little stars by my action items. And I'll put those like down at the bottom of the page. And those are for me. Those are, okay, here's your takeaway. Now you need to go do this. And then at the end of, of those seminars, then, then I take my action items and I put that uh, into a document and start working from that. Okay. The, these are the things that I can do to build on that. So, because we forget about 80% of what somebody says uh, very shortly after the presentation. Do you find that too? That, as far as the 80%, what was that again? That we forget after we walk away from the presentation of whatever we're in, no matter how great it was, we, we, take, we forget about 80% of what was said. And especially if we don't take it and do something with it. I think the, I think the key is, is just finding one or two good actionable ideas um, I tell people when they come to a, a program of mine and they're going to sit there for two or three hours or a half a day, I just, I encourage them. I say, just walk away with one good idea here. Don't, I know I'm going to impart a lot of things to you, but if you just leave with one good idea, you'll be happy. I'll be happy. So I think people just take a lot of notes and never do anything with them. And it was just a good feel good experience. So for me, it's just about taking away one or two actionable ideas, not a ton of ideas that sounded good during that day. And that's what I like for people to do at my programs. One or two that they'll take action with and that will change their destiny to some degree in order to make some change in their life. And if, that, if I can affect change, then I will have accomplished my goal. So absolutely. So, and uh, I would encourage anybody who's listening in here that um, uh, please, Jot down in the chat. Everybody should have access to the chat. Uh, so chime in, ask your questions as we go along. We don't stand on formality here, so there's no interrupting. Uh, so we definitely encourage you to ask your questions too. So um, John, when you're writing books and you take down all of these notes and you have all of these ideas, how do you channel that into your next book or your next 
item, your next thing that you're going to do? How do you know when you've got enough? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, for me, a book is born usually with a title. And it's sort of like the embryonic moment uh, that a book becomes born because every time I, I finish a book, I pretty much go, I say to myself, that's it. I, I don't think I have another book in me. And then before I know it, uh, whether it's in a conversation or whether it's something that I see on the news or in some TV magazine or in an article, something rouses a two, three, four, five word title into my head. And I just instantly say, wow, that's a great title. And that, that would be a great book. And that's literally how it's born with me. And then from there, I Google that title. Um, and sometimes I uh, will Google something and I'll find that there's already a book with that title. There's already a, a lot of articles with that title and there's a lot of subject. And I'll say to myself, well, uh, that was a good idea, but that idea has already been born a thousand times by a thousand other people. And then other times uh, I'll come up with something, I will Google it and find nothing. And I'll Google it in two or three different ways and find nothing. And it immediately will take the essence of the title and I will dot com it. And if the dot com has not been taken for that title, I figure that I've got a, um, a title going there. And then I begin to work on my notes and craft things that, that go along with that title. And sometimes it can take me six months. Uh, sometimes it can take me a couple of years to craft a book under that title, but the book is born with the title for me, not the other way around. Interesting. So like for the sales managers, I see we have several sales managers on. I mean, that, that same idea, that same way of doing that could inspire you with a sales meeting topic or, or a training series that you're going to do with your sales team. Um, I like that. I like you start with uh, the big concept, the, the catch all of whatever it is. So that, and I know that's inspirational for me with my, uh, my three unwritten books that I have started, uh, but haven't, haven't quite finished. So see, you're inspiring me. I've got to, I, I, I got to use a little more carrot and stick for myself. Well, the, the titles are, are what get me started. And uh, you'd mentioned that for sales managers. And that's absolutely true. Because if you're doing a sales meeting once a week or every other week or once a month, whatever your, your meeting du jour is, um, you do have to have a topic. You do have to have a, a core idea to start the meeting off. And then everything parallels off of that. Uh, you know, what you're going to talk about, what inspirational quotes you're going to bring to the table, uh, and while sometimes some of this can seem a little bit like, is it necessary? These are grown adults. Do they need these type things? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, they do. Yes, they uh, do. Whether they've been in the business for six months, six years, or six decades, they need these type things. They love to hear a, a good quote that you found. They love to hear a big idea that you're going to expand on. They love to hear some sales strategies. They love to hear success stories from other agents, from other people in the business. And they like a meeting that is quick, concise, gets some good information out to them and energizes them and makes them want to come to the meetings, not another meeting that they say to themselves, wow, this could have been done with just an email. Why did we have to attend in person? So the sales manager has to be responsible for energizing the troops. And so it becomes, you know, the big idea is part of every meeting. Literally, there's, there has to be a big idea there. You never know where that inspiration is going to strike. So and salespeople like sales managers, I think, get caught up in their day to day and need that inspiration so and everybody needs to be able to take a beat i think take a minute put some good again put the good stuff in so you can get the good stuff out and uh you know if you're a sales manager it's your sales team that gets the reward of the good stuff if you're a salesperson it's your customers and that customer experience that gets it for sure so if somebody feels like maybe they have more than just a sales meeting in them though, and they want to, they want to share more with, in whatever format. I mean, I think we have a lot of tools today. So whether it's a book, whether it's sharing uh, a, a vlog post, a video, or even just a short blog post or whatever information they're trying to, in whatever format they're trying to influence someone with, how would you recommend that they get started with that? Well, there's a lot of outlets and they're hungry for 
people that have good ideas, good core concepts, and uh, can bring new and interesting things to the table. And so you have the housing industry. There's a lot of people that write magazines. There's a lot of people that have newsletters. There's a lot of people that are doing vlogs and video blogs. And so it's just a matter of if you have some good core concepts, some big ideas, so to speak, that, that come to you, uh, I would suggest to start off writing some three to 500 word articles and submitting them and getting them published. And that's really the first step is, uh, and starting to contribute and give back a little bit of what you have sucked out. And that's really what, um, you know, that's all about when you start writing, whether it's articles, whether it's blogs, whether it's um, podcasts, it's about giving back what you have been taking and giving your perspective on how sales come together now. And if you're good at it, people are going to want to listen to it. And if you're not good at it, nobody's going to want to listen to it. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, the, the general public will decide whether you're good or not, not you. And uh, either people will uh, take your ideas and run with them and, or they won't. So the, the general public decides. And it also will coach and teach and train you as you go through your failures and successes, uh, as, as you fail where you could have done better and as your successes, as you can keep doing better and better on that same venue. So if you pay attention to what it is you're churning and burning out into the marketplace, the, the market will teach you. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, some of the best lessons I've learned in my life have been what I perceived as a failure at the time. And it ended up being one of the biggest rewards that I ever could have received. Um, so sometimes, sometimes we have to do that. How do you give people confidence though? I know, I, I think fear is probably the thing that stops with people maybe even questioning themselves and not having the confidence in what they, their gift is that they have the ability to share. You know, it's interesting because, um, I met when I was younger, much, much younger, a guy named Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. And Dr. Peale probably is not known by a lot of the people that are sitting in on this conversation today, but if you look him up, you'll find that he was really the godfather of positive thinking, uh, probably right along in there with Napoleon Hill, who wrote the book, Think and Grow Rich. But uh, Dr. Peale has passed away many years ago. I met him when he was an much older man, and I was definitely a much younger guy, but he wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, which is still a worldwide bestseller, you know, Absolutely. here 50 or 60 years later, and I got to meet him at this thing called a PMA rally, which was a positive mental attitude. That's what PMA stood for, positive mental attitude rally. These were uh, programs that went around the country years ago, and um, I got to go backstage. I got to meet him, and he, as I was talking to him, he actually stopped. He listened to me. He talked to me for a few minutes. It wasn't just a, a handshaking ceremony. He actually spoke to me for a little while. And he, you know, as I was asking him a few questions about, you know, what it took to be a speaker and I would like to do what they're doing and I would like to write and I would like to do some of these things. And he looked at me and he said, do you know what it is I sell? And I said, um, you sell yourself. And he goes, well, yes, but try again, young man. And I said, uh, you sell your books and your audio programs. He goes, no, I don't sell them. He says, those are for the taking. And so I just kind of looked perplexed. He said, I'll help you. He said, what I sell is the same things that, and then there were people like John F. Kennedy, Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, he named off four or five world leaders. He said, I sell the same thing that they do. And I said, well, what is that? Wow. He said, confidence. He says, that's my role on this planet is to sell confidence. And so now when I'm thinking about all the issues that are going on with things around the world, but let's just zero in on the housing industry. And people are saying, oh gosh, we've got this pandemic panic going on for buying houses. And, you know, our salespeople don't even know what to tell people right now, because right now they're, they're just, they're having to put people into these queues and some builders are raising prices daily and the realtors are getting mad and the buyers are getting mad and gosh, we don't know what to say to them. And my answer is simple. Of course, they don't know what to say to them because they don't have the confidence to just look them in the eye and tell them what's happening. They've never been taught to sell that way. They've only been taught to sell when they've got plenty of inventory. They've only been taught to sell 
you know, the ways that they have been sold before. It's kind of like uh, downselling. Most salespeople have taught to sell up. Even people at McDonald's are taught to upsell. Sure. You, know, you go in and buy a burger and they say, do you want to make it a biggie fry? You want to make it a biggie burger? You want to make it a biggie drink? Every place you go, whether it's a department store, whether it's buying a car, whether it's buying insurance, or whether it's buying a home, we're all taught to upsell and upgrade. So when I had a builder several years ago that built the Mac Daddy home with all the bells and whistles and sold for about $100,000 more than the average home they were selling, his salespeople came to a complete halt selling. They didn't understand how to start from the top and work their way down. So as I went in and retooled their way of thinking and how to sell from the top down, another word for just down selling, they retooled and began to sell even more than they were selling before. But that correlates with what's happening in the market today. Most salespeople haven't been taught how to sell tomorrow and the urgency that goes with no inventory, the urgency that goes with prices are increasing daily. They don't know what or to hourly. tell people. Yeah. Or yeah, they don't know what to tell people when they say, can you give us a price on a home? And the salesperson says, I can give you a price, but this price is good for today only. And the, and the consumer just kind of looks at them like, oh, well, I can't believe that. And they don't know how to sell around it. But let me ask you this. When you pull into a gas station and the gas price is not the same price that it was yesterday, do you walk into the 7-Eleven or to the convenience store and ask the manager, excuse me, um, I noticed gas was 30 cents a gallon less a few days ago. Would you honor that today? I'm a regular customer. Would you honor that today for me? <laughs> the answer will be. I love that analogy. That's great. You know, and so all <laughs> we're doing is actually entering where the real world is. For, for those people that are listening or viewing this, whether it's live or whether it's the recorded version of it, mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever been to Costco, uh, here's another example. Go to Costco and uh, stroll to the back of the store where you're looking for something that you wanted and the price has gone up. Go up front and ask them if they'll honor the price they had last week. I, you know, you got to be laughing right now. You know, they're not going to honor the price they had last week. They'll be polite. They'll look you square in the eye. And these are people that have never had sales training. And they'll say, you should have bought it last week. Yeah. Here's my best advice for you. When you see something you want, I would suggest you get it. And then the person might say, I also noticed that you're out of something that, I, that you had a few weeks ago. Will you be getting any more in? Oh, my God. What a, what a great answer they give you at Costco. I don't know. We never know what we're going to get. So if you see it and you want it, I always suggest you buy it then because we never know what's coming in on the truck. Now, in our industry, if we just learned how to look people square in the eye, tell them exactly what's going on, the price I'm giving you today is good until five o'clock. Tomorrow, I can't guarantee a price. Let me explain why. And you explain the issues with lumber, labor, uh, material cost, what's going on in the industry. And if they get huffy and puffy, you just have to be able to calm them down, soothe their nerves, ask them, do they want to be on a priority list or do they want to just be on your mailing list? And when they say, what's the difference? Say one, you put up money. The other one, you just put up talk. <laughs> and you know well, what's the difference well the ones that put up talk I call them at the end of the day and the ones that put up money I call them in the morning when I walk in you yeah, know it's, I have something to sell because well, I don't always have anything right now exactly and so really it, it's like Dr. Peel told me that that day that I got to meet him and still lives inside of me this day all we have is confidence and of course advocacy you know that we will fight for the customer and do everything we can to get them what they want when they want and how they want it but they'll need to trust me and roll with me and so confidence is that's what i sell when people ask me when i'm coming in to uh, do a program or to speak watch any speaker in fact i got an email I don't know, I get so many newsletters that I subscribe to because I'm always trying to stay on top of things. But I got one that said, these are the top five YouTubes that you have to watch if you're in real estate. Now, do you know what four of them were about? One, two, three, four. The four market. Them about confidence. Oh, really? That was it. Oh, interesting. That is all we have to offer. And so many salespeople are, they think they're looking for very clever wording or they're looking for some psychological way to trick people into buying. That doesn't exist. But the confidence to deal with your consumer without arrogance, there's the difference in what makes you a superstar versus an average player. Yeah, if you have that empathy and you're genuinely curious and care about people, I think people know that there's a difference there. 
And I, when you're educated and you're knowledgeable about your product and the market and what's happening, and, and you know, when your manager is telling you, hey, lump, the price of lumber is 180% of what it was three months ago, you, you got to be able to, to back that up and support it. And I agree, it, you have to be confident about it. Uh, and if you're knowledgeable and you have things, you have the material to back it up, you know, I think part of the problem is the winging it. We just want to wing it all the time instead of actually preparing for, uh, right. for those interactions. And as a salesperson, that's a kiss of death because people know, people know when you're genuine and when you aren't. I so, agree. so going back to being able to share and, and inspire comes back to knowledge and having that confidence, that confidence being the key that that's really what we're selling. Is that circling it back around? Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's all I have to sell. Uh, it, for, for agents that are in the field, what they have to sell is the information and the advocacy to their consumers. Mm -hmm. They want to be an advocate and that's what they're selling. What, what I'm selling as an educator and as a teacher and a, a writer are confidence uh, to know what you're doing, confidence to learn more each and every day, confidence to realize you don't know everything and the confidence to be able to share the correct stories with your consumers and the ability to tell those stories with absolute confidence, not to wing it, but memorialize great stories so that you can use them over and over again. And if you decide you eventually want to write about them, put them into articles. And if you think you've got more than an article, you write a blog post. And if you've got more than a blog post, you, you write a, a small book and so on and so forth. I liked what you said about how that is, when we do that, we're giving back and we're sharing knowledge with others. And, and, and that in and of itself is a, it's a form of inspiration. I mean, one of the reasons that I started doing these head to heads is they inspire me. So they inspire me to, uh, to reach out to my peers, to reach out to my colleagues and to, to learn from them and have the confidence to, to talk about things and, and go back and forth. And uh, if others find that interesting and inspirational, I think that's a good thing. Um, so, you know, I think we all benefit when we give back in whatever form. It doesn't have to be a book, I don't think. It, it, if you don't think you have a book in you, you know, start with something else. The way you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So okay. good reminder for me and for everybody else. Um, switching gears a little bit, something I have always found so fascinating in any of our conversations uh, or discussions about your travel. So for those of our audience who, who aren't familiar with your travels, can you share a little bit about what you do with that and um, some of the places that you frequent? Well, I have clients globally. Uh, so I work uh, in Europe, I work in Mexico, work in South America. And I have clients that um, I work with mostly in the housing industry. And so it's fascinating to, one, to get invited to these other parts of the world, to, to bring them, you know, the American way, if you want to put it that way, <laughs> or the JP way of sales, sales and marketing, how to deal with consumers, um, you know, consumers buying habits and the psychological influence that they can have with their buyers. And so you know, that's mostly what my travels are about. Obviously, when I'm traveling, I try to enjoy myself and I enjoy uh, photography and photojournalism. So I do a little bit of that. But uh, that's what fuels all my travels. And uh, the travels sort of open the smorgasbord of the brain in order to capture a lot of ideas. You know, when, um, when you stay in one market all the time, you tend to become very myopic in your views of what's going on and what you see and how you see the world. So uh, the ability to travel into other cultures and to see the specific nuances of how their buyers are, how their sales teams are, how they view the world, but mostly how they respect um, mostly a lot of things that come from the United States. Uh, most of my clients from outside of the country are really, they admire the U.S. way of doing business. We are the most sophisticated marketing machine on the globe today. So, you know, that's what fuels a lot of travel is their, their desire to be more like the U.S. markets. I find anytime I travel anywhere, I, um, I always get inspired. And one of the things that I started doing as I was traveling, whether it's for work or pleasure, uh, was to add on a little, uh, a, a little excursion. So add on something so I could really experience that. And so I always try if I can, if I, you know, if I'm, if I'm starting out on a Monday, then I try to go in on a Sunday so I can have some sort of experience 
um, uh, and learn something from that place. Take something away and, and let it improve who I am and how I think about things. So I think that's true whether you're, it's, it's international travel or uh, whether it's you know within the US. But some of the places I, I know uh, you, you have some interesting stories from Morocco, if I'm not mistaken. That was one of the areas that you spend a lot of time in. Yes. What, what are some Morocco. things you've learned from Morocco? Gosh, it's such a departure from other parts of the world. For instance, it's uh, you've got all these different countries in Europe. Uh, which is just north of Morocco. Morocco is, of course, located in northern Africa. Um, you cross the Straits of Gibraltar and you enter, you enter another dimension and another world there, another culture, difference in foods and languages. And, um, you know, what have I learned there? I've just learned that, you know, people see the world so much differently. Um, Morocco is a, is a Muslim country by, by most standards. And I've learned that a lot of people in the United States really have a bias or even a, a fear of the Muslim cultures. And it's just so unfounded. Uh, when I tell people I go to Morocco, they they go, oh my God, are you scared there? And I go, scared of what? Well, the, the people are, you know, there's so much going on. And I go, you've probably heard about stuff happening in Iran and Iraq and the far off Middle East. Morocco is not part of the Middle East. Morocco is thousands of miles away from the Middle East. And uh, I have nothing to be afraid of there. I have uh, friends there and I enjoy the culture and I enjoy the people and the cinematic photography opportunities that are there. So you know, what have I learned there? I've learned that people are friendly if you're friendly back to them and people invite you into their homes to have dinner if you are friendly to them. They want to learn more about you just like you want to learn more about them. So uh, I've gotten to go to, you know, funerals in Morocco. I've gone to weddings in Morocco and I've gone to people's homes in Morocco and uh, just like I have in other countries. And, um, you know, somebody says somebody died. I'm eager to just go to the funeral. I want to see how a funeral goes in another culture, in another religion, <laughs> another world. And believe me, it's fascinating. And uh, somebody says, uh, you know, so and so is getting married. I want to do what I can to go to that wedding. I want to see how those weddings are conducted. And um, you know, any kind of culture. Talk about confidence. Now, I don't know that I would have the confidence to do that, but I, I would find it fascinating. <laughs> well, just, you know, if you're not fearful, why not? I, I've been to a hundred weddings in the United States. I've been to a hundred funerals in the United States, but I want to see how it's done in other parts of the world. And let me tell you, it's done differently. And so, you know, everything from start to finish. So I enjoy the cultural aspects of seeing how other people's lives are different than ours. So that's what I've learned which also helps me expand my horizons as I'm writing, as I'm preparing workshops and programs and you know, everything from IBS programs down to programs for clients. That expansion into other parts of the world helps me get out of my optic views of just what's happening in the tiny microism of my world so that I can expand it into a much bigger component to, to realize the rest of the world. Uh, I'll never forget um, looking at a sign I went in a McDonald's, believe it or not, I was kind of hungry for just a burger and they had the Macarabia. And <laughs> I thought to myself, now that's interesting. And, you know, while in the United States, we wouldn't even think of what, what is a Macarabia. And I thought to myself, you kind of got to get rid of some of your bias. The rest of the world has, including McDonald's. Uh, so when they will name a sandwich, the Macarabia, which is just a slight takeoff of, the, of, of some of their other sandwiches, but they do it in order to make that culture feel good that we don't just have hamburgers and quarter pounders here. We've got something that we make specifically for your culture, the just macarabia. For, just for this location. Yeah, just for this country, just for this you know, uh, mm -hmm. group of people. And it's the same in Italy, and it's the same in Spain, and it's the same in Greece. Each one of these places, they have their own versions of food there. So it's kind of like McDonald's gets it. Do you? You know, Simple. everything that you're saying comes back to fear is what limits us. And when you have these experiences, I think it lessens that fear of others or other thoughts or other, you know, we've, we've heard so much in the last year about confirmation bias and we have it in business. We have it for our political beliefs. We have it for our, our culture and our country. I mean, I think that we know what we know 
don't be afraid to try something new. I've always said that growth happens when you get outside that comfort zone. So when you do something, do something, I mean, it doesn't have to be travel to Morocco, but try something, just try something that makes you a little nervous, makes you a little edgy, um, because I think you, that's the start of being able to have these fantastic journeys and these fantastic experiences and feel like you have the confidence to share something. Right. So uh, let some, if you guys are not following John on Instagram, I mean, his photography is beautiful. It is just incredible. So um, where do you share that anywhere else? I know I follow you on Instagram, so I get to see a lot of it there. Mostly Instagram. And then I will post some stuff to Facebook. And um, those are the two. Occasionally I'll throw something onto LinkedIn if I think it, it has an appropriate tagline for LinkedIn, but mostly Instagram and, and, and uh, Facebook. And what is your handle on Instagram again, just for those Amalo who are? Amalo J. Yeah, he always does things in reverse. John's, John does things differently, which we can all learn from. Well, not really. Uh, Jay Palumbo, I think, was already taken. Oh, so you had to do it that way. Yeah. Way. <laughs> Necessity is the mother of invention. So, and then um, you have a place in Greece that you visit frequently, if I understand, and have a couple of enterprises that go on there. Um, I do enjoy going to Greece. Yeah. Just, again, a totally different culture, uh, totally different atmosphere. The, the Greeks have a different perspective on the world. And you know, they, uh, there's nothing like a Greek summer is about the best way to put it. And um, so I enjoy going there also. And they have a different way of doing business. And it's kind of the, the you know, I could go down the same things like I do about Morocco, but all the same things, just uh, stepping into a different dimension and a different world. I've got a lot of friends there. And so, so beautiful. It's just uh, so I see somebody has posted in the Q and a here. Oh, we've got several, actually, if you guys will post in the quat chat, but let's see. Um, there's my quote for the next sales meeting, sell confidence. Somebody posted in here and our, oh, our friend Leah Turner is on. So JP, so many folks want to write a book, but just don't know where or how to start. So I think she joined us a little bit late. So, but um, uh, do you want to you want to give a quick recap for her to answer that question? I don't want to not answer the questions. Well, to begin with, where to write a book? It, it, you know, either you feel it inside of you or you don't. And a lot of people do feel a book inside of them. They've had an experience, they've accomplished some success in an industry, and they feel like they they have a story to tell. And if you feel that inside of you that you have a story to tell, as I mentioned to you, a book for me starts with the title, and then. Uh, I know where to take a title from there. And you just have to, the, the easiest part about writing a book is writing the book. The hardest part is selling the book. <laughs> and so a lot of times you just have to decide what is it you're writing the book for? Why, why do you want to write a book? And if you're writing a book, you know, what is your, are you just writing it for yourself? A lot of people say yes. A lot of times people say, I, I want to write a book because I want to make some money writing a book. And that's fine. And some people say, I want to have a book as a calling card to give to my customers. So you have to determine what it is you want to do with the book. Some people just, they've had interesting lives and they feel like other people will enjoy reading about their lives. Um, I don't know that, that that will sell a book about an interesting thing in your life, but you should just let the pen flow. And people ask me, uh, do I like writing? And here's the answer. I don't like writing. Oh, that's interesting. But I love having written. So there's the difference. I don't like writing, but I love having written. So it's because I love having written that forces me to get the writing done to begin with. And so I know what the feeling, the euphoria that comes when I'm finished from it. You know, it's kind of like uh, Winnie the Pooh said, I'm not sure how to describe what honey tastes like. But I know that just before I get the honey, I have this euphoria inside of me of just how good that honey will be. And so it's sort of the anticipation of what is going to happen when you get there. For me, it's the opening of that box when those books roll in from the printer and I open that box. It's almost like the birthing of a child. You open it, you see that cover, you see all those endless hours of work and sometimes months and years. And for me, it sometimes can take a few years to write a book. You open that box and you, it's like you take this sigh of everything that was heartbreaking, anguishing to write. 
finally came to fruition. And so, do I like writing? No. Do I love having written? Yes. I love having written. So there's my answer to that question. So Miss Leah, the best place to get started is just to, to take out the pen, to take out the piece of paper and just let the let it flow or to type if that's your preference or to send yourself lots of text messages. There's all kind of ways, but the real key here is to capture the essence of each idea that you feel is worthy of memorializing. And if you do that, then you're on your way to becoming an author, a published author, whether it's articles, blog posts, or eventually a book. So it's like Dr. Covey says, begin with the end in mind, whatever that end is for you, that's going to be your inspiration. And just don't lose sight of that. And you'll be able to map your way to get there exactly. very easily. So anything else, any some parting thoughts that you have for everybody today that you just want to, you just want to share and get out there for them? You know, I've had a lot of people ask me about uh, the pandemic and has it bothered me and am I quarantined? Am I going crazy? And, <laughs> and has it affected me? And my answer has been pretty much the same. The quarantine for me has been really good. I've had a lot of good things happen during the quarantine. I'm kind of glad that I've gotten to live through this phase in history. But the reality is I've been preparing for this all my life. And usually when I tell people that, they kind of go, I don't, I don't understand. How have you been preparing for a quarantine all your life? Yeah. And I will go back to my original uh, words about meeting Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Mr. Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy and uh, so many other inspirational speakers, Og Mandino, who wrote one of the best-selling books, uh, Greatest Salesman in the World. I got to meet all of these famous authors and speakers at a very early age, and they crafted my mindset. And they basically, you know, convinced me that I was educating myself. So I spent not tens of thousands, but I'm going to say maybe a few hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, early in my career with every audio I could put my hand on, every book I could put my hand on. And I invested heavily into myself. Those same books and audios today, if I were to go bankrupt, they would go for nothing. Nobody would buy them. Nobody would want them. But they are what have made me millions. So I had somebody ask me one day, they said, okay, so out of all of those books, all of those audios, all of all of that stuff that you listened to and paid all that good money for all those years, narrow it down to just like this. What would you get out of all of it? And I said, that's a good question. And here's the answer. Everything that I invested in, I can narrow down to this. They all have the same message. And here it is. I'm going to save you a couple of hundred thousand dollars. It's not about what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. Mm. That's what I got out of it. So when the pandemic hit, I was mentally prepared. I was mentally prepared to be at home. I was mentally prepared to eat differently. I was mentally prepared to not travel as much. And I had no control over any of it. So it didn't bother me. But I have heard of a lot of people that have had distress. They've been, they've got anxiety. They've put on weight. Uh, they've had all of these issues happen and they're going crazy. <laughs> and I'm not going crazy. I, you know, <laughs> I just haven't had any of those issues for me because I've been preparing for this all my life. And the preparation has been here mentally for what to do when you don't have control of something and we don't have control of this. And so the best control we can take is just to be proactive and, you know, make sure we wear masks in front of other people, whether we believe in the mask or not. I love the people who say, Oh, I don't believe in the mask. And, and, and not only that, I hate wearing them. And they look at me, Kind of like, I like wearing it because I said I wear one, but I don't know of anybody that likes wearing a mask. I don't no. know anybody who wants to wear a mask and I don't wear a mask for any reason other than to protect others. And it's the right socially mentally thing to do. But a lot of people think they are special and because they don't like a mask and because it bothers them, they shouldn't have to wear one. I get it. Everybody's got their own thing. But for me, the pandemic has not been a bad thing. It's been good for me in a lot of ways. So I've gotten a lot done. I've gotten a lot of writing done. I'm, I'm ready when the, uh, when the gate opens and we're able to run again. And uh, until then, I will sit back and continue to be uh, proactive about all the things that are going on and continue the good things going on in my life. I don't mean for that to sound too Pollyanna. It's just a reality. It's, so. Well, it's that power of positivity and being able to find the good because there, there is a silver lining if you look for it. Always. Yeah. 
So I think that's really important. And there have been some wonderful things that have happened to me in the past year. There are things, there are aspects of my previous life before all of this that I certainly miss. Uh, I miss people. I miss seeing you guys face to face. Uh, and I look forward to the day when I can do that again. But it is, uh, you know, the Zoom is something I did before Zoom was cool. So as far as that goes, you know, I just do more Zoom than I normally would. Right. Yeah. And of course, spending time with my family and moving twice in a year that that helped too. So well, thank you so much for joining. And thank you to all of you who joined us. And those of you who are going to be joining us uh, uh, on the recorded version of this, uh, I will make sure that John's uh, contact information is uh, attached to all of the videos and everything. So you can reach out to him. Check out johnpalumbo.com and read his books. They're, uh, they're pretty darn cool. So I know I've got a bunch of them in my library back here too. And John, thank you for spending some time with us today. And it's good to see you face to face, my friend. I pleasure has been on the well. phone, but it's good so to much. see you. All right. Anybody has you a question, everybody. watch this. They're welcome to drop me a note and I'm always answering my email. So I um, look forward to seeing some of you somewhere along the path along the way. Thanks, Kimberly. Absolutely. We're getting some thank yous in from our audience too. So thank you guys for joining. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.